by this video is on communication and influence. So we spoke about in class about speaking about the unspeakables and I found this topic to be really something that interests me because it's an area that I can see is so important to have right communication and that as a leader we should be communication champions and that as a leader we should be able to inspire action through our communication footnote one and as a leader we should be able to communicate the vision and objectives of of an organization in a way that we gain followership and buy-in from from our staff employees but also that we gain two two objectives which one was embeddedness which means that the organization is united for one purpose and that the ideas and the vision are embedded into the people and that needs to be done through appropriate correct good communication um, the next the next thing that you want to be able to gain is is uh, sense giving which which is helping the people to to make sense of the organization and what the vision and the mission and are like so they understand it but also that they understand the part that they're called to play within it so it's a sense giving and so as a part of a communication champion who is a person who can communicate effectively and to to their followers and to the organization they should be able to gain that embeddedness and that sense giving I also really liked what Sam said in class footnote 2 about speaking about the unspeakables and I have seen in my own life in many 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 situations I think it's definitely a part of New Zealand culture um, that often we don't speak about the things that need to be spoken about as a people but I've also seen it within our own business where there's times when you have to have conversations with people and you don't want to have them but you know for the good of the whole organization if you don't have them then things are going to go wrong but having the courage and the boldness to do that is is quite difficult and but a good leader should be able to speak about the unspeakables and just thinking of the example of the story in the textbook on page 259 footnote 1 in April in 2010 a trans ocean oil rig digging a deep sea well for BP exploded in the Gulf of Mexico killing 11 workers and spewing oil into the sea for months and it goes on to say like why didn't anyone anyone see this why did this happen you know like how how did this do, how did this happen and the sad answer within the story is that people did did see that there were issues but didn't have the courage or the guts to actually to say anything and it goes on to say that people felt that they could speak about issues that could be resolved straight away but when it came to the these big issues that they could see around health and safety and and just operation operations that were happening that weren't right people weren't saying the right thing they were and often it, it's people are more concerned with like their own welfare and not upsetting anyone or you know also it's profit driven but they're not they're not seeing the bigger picture of if these little issues aren't spoken about and aren't resolved then this the result is that people can die and the environment is destroyed and yeah so I was really inspired by this idea and concept of speaking about the unspeakables and I feel that 
it's a really, really important part of being a leader. Um, and for another example, there's a TED Talk that's the most talked about. It's the most watched TED Talk in all the world, and it's about vulnerability. And it's it's made by a doctor named Brene Brown. And she, in her video, or in her TED Talk, footnote three, talks about how people that are the most happiest are actually people who can talk about their feelings in the most open way and who actually are the most honest about situations that are happening in their lives, which is, again, becoming vulnerable, which the, the whole video is about vulnerability. But that relate, I relate this back to that concept that actually to truly live and to truly be like effective as a leader and even in, as a person, we need to we need to know how to be able to be vulnerable. We need to know how to be able to have those conversations that we don't want to have, but we actually need to have them. We actually need to be able to be completely honest and and be able to face things that often are hard to face, but once we face them, there's there's a deeper level of happiness and peace and which within within a person but then you could also relate that back to that also being within an organization like if the if the right things are talked about and if the issues are resolved and brought up then actually the organization is going to be healthy so I thought it was quite a good kind of contrast and parent and picture of how a person is if they're not talking about everything that they in the in the TED talk, Renee said that they will often start to use other vices, like they eat more, or you take pills, which we see a lot of people taking now, or you know use alcohol and other recreational drugs to to fill that place in you that hasn't actually because you can't talk about the things that need to be talked about. And I suppose you could see that in an organisation as well. Um, and at the end of the day, if an organisation behaves in that way, it will lead to disaster, as we've seen in the illustration from that story in footnote one. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was having strategic conversations, which is, again, footnote one. And I really liked the idea of of strategic conversations and thought that is such a skill that I want to gain. Um, and that, again, is, is about having the, having the insights and the ability to be able to not only ask the questions and have the guts to ask the questions, but know when to ask them and who to ask them of and being strategic about the conversations that you bring up and thinking about what you want to achieve and looking at the motives of everybody in the company and understanding that and then asking the right questions to get the right answers basically and bring out the things in people that need to be brought out. Um, I thought that the idea of strategic communication was really good. I'm just going to read out the definition. The strategic conversation, communication that takes place across boundaries and hierarchical levels about the group, organization's vision, critical strategy themes and values that can help achieve outcomes. So, I yeah, that's another, another part of this communication theory that really, really made me think and and an area that I would like to become better in. So we also looked at in class, footnote two, about why we ask questions and that a good leader knows how to ask the right questions. And that was very thought provoking. Uh, we looked at why why that is, what what asking questions does for a person, like compared to if we just 
talk to a person and tell them what to do if you actually stand back and ask a person questions then it says that it provokes deeper learning within a person that because a person is empowered to actually have to go away and really think about the situation for themselves and not just just say yes yes and be told everything they actually have to engage their brain and and look deep deeper into what what they really think about the situation um it also says that it empowers them to think and find answers for themselves but it it shows people that you care about them and about their opinions footnote one that that you value that what they're going to say and it also says that people well this is actually a part of another thing but people will always buy into an idea if they feel that they have contributed to the outcome so if a person is involved in the decision and is involved and listened to and asked questions of and that and the outcome is agreed upon like collectively you're more inclined to gain buy-in from from that employee than you are as if they're just told what they've got to do and so I've thought about myself and I definitely it's definitely harder when people ask you questions and you actually have to think but I think it definitely does help you to remember things more as well like if you've had to look at something and then you ask questions about it and come up with the ideas more than likely you've had to think about it first and then speak about it and then maybe speak about it more but even in looking at it from how much people retain information even having to think about something and then speak about something well it's more embedded into you than it would if you've just had to listen to something and actually not come up with anything like it just from like I know that when we think something and then speak it it's it's a whole lot more powerful and kind of goes into you as a person than if you just yeah if you're just listening um depending on people's learning styles so that led on into the listening part of this theory, um, footnote one, and that as a leader, we should be more interested in listening than talking, and to, but to be able to use this strategically. Um, and I, I really could see that this is an area that I want to work on. Um, failing to listen to someone will often communicate to that person that they don't matter. And when I think about myself and when I've been in situations where I've, like I, I'm with somebody, but you can tell that they're actually not really listening, it, it does really annoy you. <laughs> it does. It may, but it, it does make you feel like, oh, you're not actually interested, you don't actually care about me, or, like, it, it really does, and, um, but it's such a hard, such a hard thing to do, um, but if, as a leader, like it says that, it's the greatest sign of respect that you can show someone is by actively listening, and, and, and really, intently trying to understand what they're trying to say to you because if often too if we if someone says something and we're not really listening you can hear it in a completely different way to actually what they're trying to say and so I was really challenged with this area um, and I've done some self-assessments on it which I'll record later but it also says in the textbook footnote one that if you're a person who, if you're a leader that isn't listening to their staff, and then actually it decreases commitment and motivation, which I can relate to 
um, and just in situations that I've been in with like bosses or um, just even friends, you know, that you have and you can tell, you know, there's certain friends that you're around and they just don't listen and they don't really care about what you're saying. Um, or, and they always, like, you'll say something, but then they'll start to talk about themselves, and you're like, you didn't even really listen to what I just said. And that, yeah, I just know how that makes me feel. And so I'm really, really, again, trying to actively work on this area of my life because I want to, one, be a really good, or one, be a communication champion, but also a really good listener, which obviously the two go hand in hand. The other concept within this theory that I'd like to talk about is the idea of dialogue versus discussion, footnote one, and that, which I, I thought was, a really, was really good, like I thought it was a really good way to look at how we should communicate and the difference between what we'll achieve a better result. So dialogue being having mutual a mutual purpose within the conversation, footnote one. Um, whereas discussion is more having your own agenda or one purpose. The person that's having the discussion has got their purpose, but they're not actually mutually opening up the conversation to allow everybody else to contribute. Um, so within that bit, I thought, as a, and it's got here, is as a leader. Like as a leader, you can learn to be a better listener. You can focus your total attention on what other people are saying, and work hard to listen. Use eye contact, ask questions, and paraphrase the message, and offer positive feedback. Yeah, so that was a part of the listening, but also that comes into this you know, idea of dialogue, which which ultimately should, should mean that it creates more of a collaborative result where your dialogue is opening up questions and ideas within the group and allowing for others to speak and add their ideas and and with the person that's leading listening and taking all of that in. Um, so it's more focused on allowing the group to help to solve the problem or the situation and allowing everybody to be able to feel that they're valued and have an opinion than a discussion which is one person's agenda and this is what's going to happen, and yeah, so, so yeah, so it says here, um, that, footnote one, that to, um, dialogue is to slow down, and to listen more than you talk, to focus on the whole outcome, and the whole group, seek common ground within the people that are around you, to, Many people have pieces of the answer and, and making sure that everybody is heard and that the, ro the result is is that we, you should be able to see a bigger picture resolved, have long-term innovation and a solution, fix the big issue and all on board for the decision, whereas a discussion outcome which is focus on the one person's interest can often be... Can often be um, offensive and defensive behavior going on within the conversation and it can be short-term solutions you're using your authority to get the job done rather than allowing your, yourself to influence the whole group and gain their commitment and often it's using like a, an agenda you're, you're using your power again your position to to have the conversation and that usually um, the results never as good as if it comes through a dialogue based conversation. Yes. So so that 
was very interesting and, and just wanted to talk a little bit about the superintendent's case study that we did within this topic. And that again was really interesting to look at and to think about how the superintendent had passed the information on to the principal and then the principal had passed the information on to the teachers and how within that you could see the communication channels had been really broken down and with the result being that the teachers came back and you know were like defensive about it and not positive about, about it at all and I thought like looking back at what it means to be a communication champion you can see that neither the superintendent or the principal achieved that embeddedness which is that united you know of um, that united vision within the organization for everybody being on board or the the sense sense making which sense giving sorry which helping people to understand and make sense of the idea um, so reading more into what a communication champion looks like and the embeddedness and the sense giving where you could see that there was some really big breakdowns there in being able to communicate what they were wanting to achieve to the staff and then taking it away and looking at how, how it could be done differently was, was that first of all it, the communication channels needed to have probably been more in a dialogue format where there was and with rich channels of communication footnote two happening so that actually when the idea was conveyed everybody had an opportunity to kind of discuss it and understand it and talk about you know what struggles would be involved with this but also gain that deeper meaning and that deeper understanding of actually what was needing to happen. And that could have been done through the superintendent's communication, first of all to the principal, being more, more open and taking a little bit more time to actually convey exactly why they needed this and, and then having some examples in place of, of how others may have achieved what they were going to achieve, which was the performance objectives. So, so reading through the theory and then applying this to that case study, you can see that there was a lot of steps in the process within, within that communication that happened from the superintendent to the principal to the teachers. It could have been a whole lot better. Yeah, so that was an interesting case and I think going back to steps, so yeah, the superintendent speaking to the principal and then the principal taking more time to get together with the teachers and and first of all him having been brought in more to the idea himself rather than just seeing it as as another thing he's got to get them to do, but actually understanding why and 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 trying to then like even tell have an example for them of other people that have achieved this and how they've done it and maybe coming up together with a plan of how they could have all achieved it and how it could look like from like a in a time frame or even having a smart goal in place of how they were going to get it done um, because as we talked about in class teachers are always overloaded with paperwork and other other things that they have to do besides teaching so that it would have been very important for for the superintendent the teacher then to the te to the uh, the principal then to the teachers to just have had more of a dialogue focused conversation happening yeah um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the article which was in the using influence to get things done. Um, I'm just going back here. Where are we? Um, yep. 
right? So using, so this footnote four, using influence to get things done. And it was an article about a, C, uh, about a, a lady in an organization named Kate, who had a really, really big job within IT to be able to bring a company whose budget was way over back into line to be able to change the whole systems. But it talks about how a person who can have influence is a person who can achieve the company's goals in a way that can, they can face like huge opposition or at the beginning like without even having talked about it first you know there's massive opposition to the to the to the um, so solution that you have but that that a, a major major part of having influence and succeeding is being able to communicate in a way that will be able to bring everybody on board and be able to, like as we've just talked about, you know, get that embeddedness, get that sense, sense giving from, from your colleagues. And so within the article, it talked about five concepts that they've seen uh, within people that have achieved great, great results in companies, having that ability to communicate and influence in a way that they can change major problems that an organisation is facing. And if you look out there now, majority of people that earn the best money are people that can come in and they can actually solve massive problems for companies. Problems that no one else wants to face, but these people have the ability to be able to come in and to be able to look and communicate and sit back and have the have the strategies needed to be able to get the problem solved. So, so just looking at this case, it says the first one was to build up courage to raise difficult problems, which is again what we just spoke about earlier about being able to speak about the unspeakables. These people come in and they ask. They have the ability to ask the questions that often nobody else has the courage to ask. They, they will go straight there in a way, though, that is received. So they leave their personal agenda at the door. And the, pers the personal success that they gain, which is obviously underneath, well, for a lot of people, they want to be successful, but this person who can have the biggest influence and change the problems will come in and they're not about themselves. They're not about getting themselves ahead. They're not about furthering your own career. They're about getting the, they're about dealing with the problem. They're about how can I benefit this organization and how can we, how can we do this? Like it's, it's, it's not about them. And yeah, their personal success will come from serving their company well. Footnote four, not from not from power struggles or from having to, you know, being right. It's their main focus is how can I serve this company well? How can I solve this problem? Number three was to rise above the game, but not but don't ignore it. And this means that they the biggest key was they enlist the support of their bosses. And I've put down, they have mentors, because I thought, well, that kind of correlates into that. They have mentors, and, and it goes on to say that you never want to be alone on an island. So, and to seek, to seek out the people that are in front of you, um, opinions, and be open to that, and to be open to receiving their input. That that is another important part of gaining this influence and being able to transition a company. Is that you're, yeah, you're, you're, you know that you might have a bigger solution, but you're not, but you're still maintaining those relationships and 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 receiving the advice of your bosses and your mentors. 
I suppose it keeps it's a humble attitude really in that you're you don't want to be alone like if you're if you're thinking you know it all and not you know allowing others to speak into your life then you will be alone on an island <laughs> and it says you don't want to be alone on the island you want to have you want to have those connections and you want to be able to maintain those relationships with people that that you know have have good things that they know to speak into you so the other thing it said within this number three was seek to understand the might and set of all members of the group and that your job when you're going in and wanting to bring change and influence is you actually really need to get where each person is at and it says that not everybody has pure motives and you need to understand that so you need to be able to have those and that comes back to those strategic conversations like understanding what others are wanting to gain out of things because you a lot of the time you will be dealing with people that are about their own self-interest and, and learning how you can work with that because often it won't be that you can change them in, in that area of their, you know, of their motives but how you can work with that and still be able to gain their, their buy-in on what you're trying to do. And then the next number four was engage the group by using emotional intelligence. And this says about having a humble attitude and a fact-driven presentation and how you only have influence to sell your agenda. So, so that's emotional intelligence, so being able to connect on that level with the people that you're trying to influence on that emotional intelligence level and being able to have the facts that you need to be able to prove why this thing you're trying to do, why in, in, in Kate's case she wanted to change the whole system into a whole new system so that meant massive massive cutting away of costs and massive spending to start with for a long-term result but she had to be able to have the facts there to be able to prove that this would work but be able to do it in a humble and humble way that wasn't I know everything you know nothing but in a way that she can present the facts but then still be connecting with the people and allowing for them to be able to voice how they feel and yeah, um, yeah. Not to it says not dominate discussions, and and again I put that back into to using looking at the theory. It's having again a conversation that is a dialogue conversation. It's keeping keeping it so that you are not allowing your emotions to get involved, but you are. You're answering, asking the questions and you're listening and you're putting your idea out there and being able to get feedback and yeah and people will feel will buy in when they feel they have contributed and that's again what we talked about earlier is that if people can have that embeddedness and that sense giving within within them then you've got you've got their buy-in to what you're trying to do goes on to number five, last point, be tenacious because decisions do not necessarily guarantee actions and that says it's about, you know, that silence is something to be concerned about, positive or negative silence, because often that means there's no action that's happening or usually if a person receives an idea and they're, and they're going to do something about it, they're like, right, this is what we're going to do, let's do this, let's do that, but if people are receiving the idea but not actually discussing it and, and then even if it's, you know, this won't work, this won't work, at least you're getting that so that you've got somewhere to go and somewhere to work, work with and you can then address the barriers that they feel like they're facing but that you need to be, you need to be encouraging communication, you need to be drawing out action and then having a follow-up plan on how, how it is we're going to get through this, how we, what are we doing from here, like I think about, you know, like 
um, objectives, manage, um, MBOs, and also SMART goals, and you know, like going away from these kind of meetings and actually having some real clear direction in place of, okay, we've talked about this, we've come to this decision, what are we going to do about it? So they said that that was another really important part of, of a person who can have that influence and be able to bring about huge change in organisations and deal with major problems, that there were five traits that they have. And in the end, Kate did end up achieving her goal of being able to help this IT company transition to a whole new place, and she did that by meeting one-on-one, -on -one, first of all, with all the people that were important, like she was strategic about that, about their person that she needed to have those strategic conversations with. And she she brought in to their mind the idea that she had. She explained to them in probably a dialogue way why, why this needed to happen. Um, talked through some of the, probably asked some of the big questions that she needed to ask and got, got them thinking. And then when she went into the meeting with everybody, she had already had that time to be able to communicate one-on-one -on -one and, and get that buy-in from the whole group. And in the end, she was able to transition that whole company into a whole new place and, they, and, and get them to spend more money initially, but they did gain a long-term benefit from that and eventually were spending less. Um, and so it was a good story and a really good example, again, of, of how communication can bring huge change for you as a leader and how leaders need to be communication champions and how leaders need to know how to ask the right questions and how leaders need to be able to listen and be strategic and realise that it's not all about what, what you know as a leader, but it's about how can you enable others to bring what they know into the package as well as what you know and make that work in the best way possible. So I really did, really, this is a, this is a big area in my life that I want to work on and become really, really good at. Um, it's an area that I may choose to study in later on. Communications is something that I'd like to look at a bit deeper um, because I can just see from own, my own life experiences of dealing with people and having a business and even having children and running groups that I run that actually if you can't communicate properly or you know if, we, if you can't say something to someone and get them to understand then it's just useless <laughs> and if you can't have a conversation with someone without causing the whole situ situation to blow up and everyone gets offended and upset and then it's useless like if you can't if you can't and that's you know my goal is I want to be able to come in and ask the right questions and I want to be able to be the type of person that can have a conversation with someone that can change their life or can change the organization because of the conversation that you've just had oh and coming down to how you've done it what you've asked and then how the person's received it and yeah, I see, I see this is really, really important. Um, there was one other thing that I wanted to talk about, which was candor. And that that was find my notes on that. That was in how honest candor is how honest and forthright expression of a leader's thinking. So it's an honest, forthright expression of a leader's thinking. So it's being candid will mean you can be direct, honest about exactly what you think and feel. And this is something that, again, I don't think is a real cultural thing in New Zealand. I think that like we often talk around the issue, but it takes a while for us to actually just go, boom, this is the issue. And that I'm more a, I am more a person who is more straight to the point. <laughs> I don't really like to talk about nothing. 
I'd rather be talking about things that matter. So, so I, I think this is another really important part of communication and really liked what said, um, people, you know, that people will know exactly what is happening for them within the job. And it said um, that there was a story about Jack Walsh who'd go into organisations and he um, would say, so who's had a real honest evaluation of their work in the last year? And he said only 10% of people would put their hand up. But then he'd also say, well, who's given a real candor evaluation of, to someone about their work? And again, only 10% put their hand up. And he just said how important it is that, you know, we can be brutally honest at times. Like, obviously, it's still got to be done in the right way because being brutally honest in a, can also come across as mean. But sometimes you are just going to have to say it and because it's for the good of that person or and the organisation. So, yeah, and it had a quote in there which I thought was quite interesting. Of, we don't want to, the opposite of candorness is having a disease of terminal niceness. And I thought, oh, you can, that's definitely something I've experienced with people. And even I think of myself as a person and I think I, I can understand when I just be nice instead of being honest and I don't like it. But sometimes you just don't really want to hurt the person's feelings. So you so you just you just say what's nice instead of what's true. But actually if you can say it in the right way and actually it could be it could be the conversation that changes a person's life. Say if you look at it from, you know, if I was in a job and I was doing a really bad job and actually thinking about this now, I have got an example of that. I worked as a dental assistant and I am not naturally, especially back then, I, I wasn't naturally a real details person um, and within the job as a dental assistant, obviously it's a little bit like a PA. You have to be very methodical and everything needs to be put back in the right place. And and then I also, so, so I had that that I had to deal with. And then I also wasn't very good at taking instructions. Um, so I had many times when my dentist would come to me and talk about those two issues and say, you need to learn how to put things away in the right place first time because I went to find it and it wasn't there and she would also say when I tell you to do something you need to listen straight away because it's so important for me that when I'm trying to do this procedure like you know because sometimes it can be quite it's very stressful dentistry and I need you to be able to just do what I say at the time and and like obviously you know she she sometimes could say it in a way that wasn't the easiest to receive. However, for me and my role and the role that I was called to play, I needed to be able to achieve those two things. And luckily, she had the candor. She was also South African, so she had a way more straight way of saying things than a whole lot of Kiwi people do. But it really it challenged me and it was hard to take but it helped me to become a really, really good dental assistant. And in the end, when I left, she said, you know, when you first came in, you know, it was really hard. But when I left, she said, you're one of the best dental assistants I've ever had. And she's had quite a few. And she said, you know, you, we, worked so, we worked so well together as a team. We could, we could see more patients than anyone else. We always, we got on with all our patients. We worked smoothly. You know, it was... It was good, and I was so thankful to her, maybe not so much at the time, but, but later on, for actually having the, the candleness to be so honest and, and address things that needed to be addressed, rather than the opposite, which you see a lot of people just going away and being frustrated and annoyed and bitching about people behind their backs, but not actually, not actually really being straight up and honest to that person who needs to hear some sort of things. 
so yeah, so that's my example of candleness and how I want to be, um, as long as I can do that in a way that's going to be received in a, not in the right way and not nasty and yeah. So that's the end of this video.